as a GI and soft tissue pathologist, this is one of my favorite topics because I see a lot of mesenchymal tumors of the GI tract. I start with this a picture because these are the, my two mentors from the University of Michigan. Um, most of you probably recognize some of these. One or one, go blue, one, one or both of these people, Sharon Weiss on the left and Henry Appleman on the right. The reason I show this picture is because I remember um, looking at GI stromal tumors as a resident and as a fellow, and the approach to these was really totally different depending upon whether you were a soft tissue pathologist or a GI pathologist. And actually, these two groups have been battling about how to handle GI stromal tumors for a long period of time. In the end, the way I view it is kind of the, G the soft tissue pathologist kind of won out. Um, and I'm going to talk about the difference in approach. Um, Henry was more sort of, I can recognize, I've seen thousands of these and I can recognize them as either benign or malignant. The soft tissue pathologists were more like, well, that's actually not completely reliable and we're going to do some risk um, assessment, which is where we ended up. So the way I'm going to approach this is... Um, sort of divided up into the primary cytology, you know, the differential for a spindle cell tumor versus an epithelioid tumor. Talk about the most common entities and where appropriate, the use of ancillary diagnostic techniques, mostly immunohistochemistry. So my approach, the bottom line is the most important, prove or disprove any mesenchymal lesion is a GI stromal tumor for reasons that we're going to talk about. How do you do that? Well, Anatomic location does help. Um, some things are common in some locations. Some things are very rare in other locations. What's the site within the GI tract? For example, as Laura just said, GI stromal tumors of the appendix are ridiculously rare. They're also exceedingly rare in the esophagus, but they're pretty common in the stomach and small bowel. Also, where is the location in the wall? Is it mucosal? Is it mural? Um, is it more, more deep-seated? That can also help because some things are, are more typical than others to be superficial versus deep. Overall, in terms of uh, GIS, most of them, as you can see, are spindled. A smaller percentage are epithelioid, but some of them are mixed. And again, always prove or disprove something is a GIS because GIS, as you know, has very specific treatments. So let's talk about GIS. The only point that I really want to make is down here is that the most common location by a long shot is the stomach followed by the small bowel. Colon and rectum, we see those on occasion, particularly in the anorectal area. I do want to mention that sometimes you actually have GI stromal tumors that are not attached to the GI tract, like in the omentum, the retroperitoneum. Those are called EGIS or extra gastrointestinal stromal tumors. But, and the rules for those are not entirely clear. Um, as I mentioned, the esophagus is a really rare location for a GI stromal tumor. Nobody really cared about GI stromal tumors, to be honest, until about the early 2000s. Actually, back in the old days, they were, they were actually considered and called lyomyomas and lyomyosarcomas. And then it became clear that these were something completely different than smooth muscle tumors. And this whole um, version or, uh, of human uh, pathology was dedicated to GI stromal tumors. And I'm going to just give you some of the highlights from this particular edition of human pathology. And this, if you ask me, is probably the most important article that was published of all the articles in that uh, human pathology. This is the first time that we had really ever encountered um, this risk assessment that now all of you are quite familiar with. So they, instead of calling just benign or malignant or of uncertain malignant potential, they now consider them either very low risk, low risk, intermediate risk, or high risk. And as you can see, this was based upon only two parameters, tumor size and mitotic counts. Um, people were very excited about this because, you know, predicting behavior of GI stromal tumors was notoriously difficult. And if all you did was have to measure it, and count mitotic figures, people are like, oh, well, that's not too bad. And, you know, plug it in and, and figure out what the risk is. And so there was some excitement about this. Uh, you know, here are some issues with regard to risk stratification for GI stromal tumors. Hey, this is great. It's easy to do. Two parameters to record. Reasonably reproducible, although I would argue that counting mitotic figures is not necessarily a reproducible uh, feature, but okay reasonably reproducible. The biggest problem uh, that was clear to me and most people right off the bat was it grouped GI stromal tumors from all sites together, right? There's nothing in that prior slide that showed you anything about stomach versus small bowel versus colon or rectum. 
And we know that GI stromal tumors from different parts of the GI tract are really totally different tumors. They look different and they act different. So to group them all together and use two parameters is way overly simplistic. I mean, it'd be like essentially writing an article on uh, cancer of the GI tract and, and putting in 50 cases of gastric cancer and 50 cases of colon cancer. Um, nobody would do that because we know that those are totally different tumors. And the same thing applies here, although it wasn't as appreciated. It also, the thing that still actually drives me crazy is that it actually still ignores other proven morphologic predictors. For example, and I'll show you pictures of this, when a GI stromal tumor invades the overlying mucosa, and surrounds the glands, that's always a bad sign. Um, but, you know, it's never to be found in any of this risk stratification analysis, but it's highly predictive of uh, malignant clinical behavior. Nevertheless, um, you know, people were still kind of happy to only have to deal with two morphologic th items. And then the other thing is, you know, if you think about it, you never call anything benign. And we know that actually there are plenty of clinically benign GI stromal tumors. And instead, we now call them very low risk. Okay, well, that's not a big deal.